afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to our first afternoon session of our conference of the spirit of commercial republics, money, music, and morals. I'm trying to vary which of these three of this alliterative title comes first. Uh, we have one paper uh, this afternoon and a commentary on it. Uh, our speaker this afternoon is Helena Rosenblatt. Uh, she is the executive director of the Graduate Program of History at the center, the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Uh, being an undergraduate of Queens College, which is part of the City Universities of New York, uh, she has a very warm place in my heart. Uh, Helena's work is principally on 18th and early 19th century uh, French and Swiss uh, intellectual history. Uh, her first book uh, is on Rousseau and Geneva, From the First Discourse to the Social Contract, of which more in just a moment. And her second book is on liberal values, on uh, Benjamin Constant and the politics of religion. Uh, Rousseau and Geneva, the, the quality of this book as a work of history. When Ben Leinert, a postdoc, and I were going over our possible candidates for the meeting, I mentioned Helena, and he leaped from his seat <laughs> and said that he had been reading this fabulous book, Rousseau in Geneva, and we have to have her. <laughs> now, I assumed he was telling the truth. <laughs> but he is a postdoctoral fellow, and therefore there's always an element of servility in such a I believe in that. <laughs> However, uh, 10 minutes ago, his wife, Helen, walked in. And I said, well, I knew you were coming to Mary Sue Morrow's talk on music and to listen to the music. But why are you here now? <laughs> She's an editor of medical textbooks. It wasn't such an obvious connection. And she said, my husband has praised the book that highly. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure is on. <laughs> now, dissimulation and truth telling are compatible with each other. <laughs> but my guess is he wasn't dissimulating at all. Uh, our commentator today is Carolyn Purnell. Uh, Carolyn is concluding her work as a postdoctoral fellow at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Her PhD is from the University of Chicago. Uh, her book on enlightened bodies that has a very, very lengthy subtitle. It's getting changed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, whoever gave you that advice, it was very good advice, <laughs> is being published by Norton in 2017. Uh, it's a trade book, and she's working on a more uh, scholarly version of this. She recently, her book was recently the subject of an engagement at the Huntington Library, a seminar at the Huntington Library. Uh, she, I think it's fair to say, is one of our most distinguished young scholars, and we're pleased to have her here. Now, that they're both wearing green, <laughs> and that Ben Liner is wearing green, <laughs> and that my colleague Zarko Minkoff is wearing <laughs> green, and that the brochures for the meeting are green, only reflects the fact that the colors of Roosevelt <laughs> University are green and white. So we're very. That. <laughs> We're very thankful they've come, and they've come in the conventional dress in which we find them. So please join me in welcoming Helen and Carolyn. And Helen's talk is on Benjamin Constant, uh, then and now. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, for inviting me, and thank you to the Montesquieu uh, Forum, and um, the Jack Miller Center and the Templeton Foundation. It's a great honor to be invited and I just love the conference so far, so I hope I can keep it going, uh, but it's really been wonderful and thank you for your comment. 
ahead of time. Yes, um, the subject is Benjamin Constant's liberalism then and now. The consensus today is that Constant is a classical liberal. In other words, a thinker primarily concerned with safeguarding the rights of the individual against the encroachments of the state, an advocate of small government, and a believer in the free market. This argument is usually made with reference to Constant's famous lecture on the liberty of the ancients compared with that of the moderns. Sometimes his scattered remarks about Rousseau, generally respectful but also critical, are mentioned, as well as the faith in commerce Constant expresses in his anti-Napoleonic polemic on conquest and usurpation. Rarely mentioned, but certainly useful for this point of view, is his commentary on the work of Phil and Jerry, which has just been translated and published by Alan Cahan for the Liberty Fund, and in which Constant strongly champions laissez faire, laissez passer. But by far the most frequently cited text to establish his liberal credentials is Constant's essay on the liberty of the ancients in which he declares that, quote, since we live in modern times, I want a liberty suited to modern times. Unlike the ancients, he continues, modern men aspire to individual liberty um, and independence from government above all. Rather than participating constantly in politics, they want simply to live in peace and security so that they can dedicate themselves to the pursuit of their private pleasures. Again and again, these words have been cited to prove that Constant's liberalism was primary, primarily about protecting the individual against claims made on him by the state or the community. And this supposedly makes him a classical liberal. In my paper today, I'm going to argue that the designation of Constant as a founding father of classical liberalism is something invented in the late 20th century and has, in fact, very little to do with Constant's intentions or how Constant was perceived during his own lifetime or, uh, or finally, how he was read for years after his death. Rather, Constant's invention as a classical liberal, a proponent of self-interest, individual rights and commerce as opposed to virtue has very much to do with the Cold War and the invention of the so-called Anglo-American tradition, which redefined what it meant to be liberal. Constant was indeed a liberal in his lifetime, but he became a classical liberal thanks to the Cold War. My paper will focus on Constant's changing reputation in America and France. Americans learned of Constant as early as March 25th, 1800, when newspapers announced that he had been named to Napoleon's tribunate. A few weeks later, it was re reported that Benjamin Constant had become the leader of the opposition to Napoleon on the tribunate, and that the official French press was therefore accusing him of harboring designs unfavorable to the stability of the French government. It will be a matter of no surprise, continues the article, if Benjamin the Swiss should succeed in overtoning the throne of Napoleone the, Sir, the Corsican. American newspapers testified to Constant's growing stature as a politician, deputy, and journalist during the Restoration. In 1818, he is referred to as the leader of the so-called Liberal Party. His name appears frequently in association with that American favorite, the Marquis de Lafayette. In 1823, Americans learned that Constant had lost an election, and it was said that in him, the chamber has lost one of its most distinguished men and humanity one of its purest and firmest advocates. He was further referred to as the intrepid Constant, the celebrated member of the Chamber of Deputies, and the well-known liberal. American newspapers hence testify to the relatively new use of the word liberal as a political label. The first known use of the word as a political labor for a party in particular was in Spain in 1812. They also provide a fascinating glimpse into the beginnings of party formation in France to which Benjamin Constant contributed. We learn, for example, that in 1817 there are three tickets in the French election, the ministerials, the independent liberals, and the ultra-royalists. 
Benjamin Constant and Lafayette are described as independent liberals. Throughout this period of the Bourbon Restoration, Constant is described as being one of the leaders of the liberals. He is also reported as responsible for a new journal, La Minerve Française, described as a periodical brochure of uncommon excellence and enlightened literature, whose political character is labeled as libéral, using the French spelling of the word, indicating that the term is still quite foreign in America. The words liberal and liberalism in their political sense were used very little in America until the 20th century, and when they were used, they most often described something European. But what does it actually mean to be a liberal in Restoration France? It's not so obvious. Suffice it to say that at this point in time, it has much to do with defining and defending genuinely representative government and with building a stable political order after the cataclysmic upheavals of the French Revolution. Not only did Constant write a constitution for Napoleon, but he wrote countless articles and made hundreds of speeches trying to teach the French people constitutional and political principles. He was also a great constituency man who traveled the country building networks of liberals and encouraging people to vote. For this, he was under constant police surveillance. He was, as many of his written works demonstrate, worried about the political ignorance of the French, and he worried especially about political apathy. From the beginning, of the, uh, from the beginning to the end of his political career, Constant worried in particular about individualism, which was, as Tocqueville tells us, a new word for selfishness. Constant worried that the French were too focused on their own self-interest to be good citizens. They needed to learn about self-sacrifice and patriotism, without which he was certain a constitutional representative regime would not survive. For services rendered to France, Constant was honored with a state funeral on December 12, 1830. The entire chamber of deputies attended and the city of Paris turned out en masse. Constant had, by the end of his life, become a national hero. Stirring eulogies were delivered by his graveside and newspapers lionized him. According to one paper, France owed, owed Constant eternal gratitude because, I quote, no other writer has contributed as much to her political education. No other writer has been better at popularizing constitutional questions and rendering them familiar to all classes of citizens. Constant's death and funeral were widely covered in American newspapers. Several papers reported that 80,000 National Guards attended his burial, as well as the entire Chamber of Deputies. Benjamin Constant was called one of the most intrepid asserters of liberty in France, whose, I quote, whole life has been a perpetual struggle against aristocracy and all the oppressive powers. As a public writer, tribune deputy, he has waged war 30 years against despotism in all shades, and to him more than any other belongs the credit of extinguishing it. He has died shrouded by his own glory. Many American newspapers repeated these or similar words. Some Americans also took an early and lively interest in Constant's writings on religion. This would certainly have pleased him since he thought his work on religion was his most important undertaking and accomplishment. And yet his writings on religion have been and continue to be neglected by modern scholars since they do not fit with their view of him as a classical liberal interested primarily in safeguarding an individual's rights and self-interests. A quick summary will not do justice to his five-volume magnus opus, uh, nor to his several essays and chapters on religion, but one crucial theme or point vehemently repeated in them is to argue against some of his liberal colleagues that religion should be valued and in fact cherished because it teaches self-sacrifice. It combats selfishness teaches men to think beyond the circle of their narrow self-interest, which is crucial in any viable state, the kind of state that Constant was trying to build. On the publication of Constant's five-volume opus, De la Religion, Constant became a favorite of a group of American Protestants who translated and disseminated his religious ideas. They were the friends and disciples of the foremost American Unitarian preacher and theologian, William Ellery Channing, who also commended 
uh, Constant's religious works. George Ripley, one of the most influential men members of this circle, professed admiration for Constant's services as a liberal politician, but he predicted incorrectly, as it turns out, that it was above all for his religious writings that Constant would be remembered. These writings Ripley wrote attacked the selfish and material principle that reigned in France. In Constant, Ripley found a cheering example of a devotion to principle and of faith in humanity. Here was a man who devoted his life to defending the inborn rights of the soul. As early as 1827, readers of America's leading Unitarian journal, The Christian Examiner, learned about Constance de, de la Religion. Constance's fine work was said to combine vast erudition with most forcible thoughts. In September 1834, the journal carried a full review of the book by Orestes Brownson, who praised Constant for his striking and important ideas. The emanation of a benevolent heart, Constance de la Religion, made excellent reading for true Christians. Intended to, quote, increase our love for mankind, it was bound to warm the heart and inspire us with new zeal and confidence. These early readers of Constant read him as someone who fought against self-interestedness and preached instead a love of humanity. In the middle to the late 19th century, Constant's reputation seems to have gone into eclipse for a while. I say seems because more research needs to be done before we can be sure. I should, however, mention Karl Marx, who read his work on religion, by the way, but who unsurprisingly dismissed Constant as just another pathetic mouthpiece of bourgeois society. We pick up the story in mid 20th century when Constant's political writings were suddenly perceived as relevant and useful. This is also when Constant becomes a classical liberal, in other words, as someone who believes in small government, trust in the market economy, and who emphasizes self interest, individual interest. This transformation, the refashioning of Constant as a classical liberal, coincide, I argue, with the invention of the Anglo-American liberal tradition, a term and designation that did not exist before the middle of the 20th century. As I show in my forthcoming book on the history of liberalism, it was a product of the ideological wars fought against totalitarianism. As Duncan Bell has shown, John Locke also became characterized as a founding father of liberalism around this time. The transformation of Constant into a classical liberal most likely began with the Austrian-born economist and philosopher Friedrich von Hayek, whose famous book, The Road to Serfdom, in 1944, warned against the perceived dangers of the welfare state, and which launched an important debate on the relationship between political and economic freedom. Hayek was an admirer of Constant, <coughs> and by reading him selectively, selectively and partially, saw him as someone whose ideas were an antidote to the creeping socialism Hayek saw all around him. At the London School of Economics and later at the University of Chicago, Hayek recommended Constant to his students. And through Hayek, Constant gradually became a darling of the so-called libertarian movement in America, a movement which likes to think of itself as the genuine expositor of classical liberalism. These kinds of appropriations and readings are one avenue by which Constant became known as a classical liberal. If Friedrich Hayek and his disciples were crucial to Constant's 20th century reinvention as a classical liberal, so was undoubtedly Isaiah Berlin, and perhaps even more so. In his landmark essay of 1958, Two Concepts of Liberty, Berlin showcased Constant as one of the first writers in history to understand and warn of the tendency modern democracies have to become totalitarian. The genius of Constant was that he endorsed a negative rather than a positive idea of freedom. In contrast to theorists like Rousseau, to whom free freedom meant the possession of a share of public power, Constant apparently viewed freedom as non-interference or lack of coercion. Having witnessed the French Revolution firsthand, Constant understood that liberty in the Rousseauian or positive sense could easily end up destroying many of the negative liberties that Berlin held sacred. In other words, Constant understood the need to protect the individual from the state. 
And this is what made him, in Berlin's eyes, a true liberal, and indeed, one of the, quote, most eloquent of all defenders of freedom and privacy in the Western tradition. Berlin's essay, like Hayek's, obviously had a polemical purpose. Berlin himself admitted that his emphasis on negative liberty was due to his fear of 20th century dictatorships in Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, and elsewhere in the world. By the time Berlin wrote his essay, the main danger was Soviet-style communism, and his goal was to defend his own vision of freedom against contemporary communist thought. Hayek followed up two years later with his The Constitution of Liberty, in which he discussed what he called the continental brand of liberalism, which was concerned with positive freedoms, and the Anglo-Saxon brand of liberalism, which was concerned with negative freedoms. Neither Hayek nor Berlin was actu were actually the first persons to interpret Constant through the anti-totalitarian lens. In 1941, Helen Byrne Lippmann, the second wife of the noted American commentator and journalist Walter Lippmann, published an abridged and translated version of Constant's anti-Napoleonic track on, on the spirit of conquest and usurpation. In her introduction, Lippmann explained that she was part of a group of concerned citizens who wished to revive the, quote, forgotten classics of resistance to dictatorship and aggression. She hoped that making available Constant's prophetic text would help shore up resistance to Hitler. But it was undoubtedly Isaiah Berlin's reading of Constant, with its bifurcated view of negative versus positive liberty, an individualistic conception of liberalism that would have the greatest influence. It received strong support from other influential Anglophone theorists and scholars writing around the same time. For Jacob Talman, Benjamin Constant's value lay in his early realization that the true enemy of individual freedom was totalitarian democracy. John Plamenatz described Constant as someone who feared democracy because of the harm it could cause the individual. 20 years later, Guy Dodge was still admiring Constant for having understood the dangers of totalitarianism. Meanwhile, in America, Hayek's American disciples showcased Constant in the newly founded libertarian journal, The New Individualist Review. Along with Hayek himself, the economist Milton Friedman served as an editorial advisor on this journal. The subscription list of The New Individualist Review never numbered more than 800, but included the editors of several prestigious magazines and newspapers, many university and college libraries, as well as prominent academics throughout the United States. In its winter 1964 issue, the editor-in-chief of the journal, Ralph Reiko, published a 10-page précis of Constant's life and thought, celebrating him as one of the great individualists of the past. I remind you here of Constant's lifelong battle against individualism. In 1971, John Rawls' landmark book, A Theory of Justice, created a stir and a major debate by showing how a, liberal, how a liberalism based on individualism and self-interest should logically entail the welfare state. For the sake of argument, he posited a group of intensely self-interested but also reasonable individuals and showed that such self-interested individuals endeavoring to maximize their advantages in conditions of uncertainty would actually choose not the market, but the welfare state instead. Rawls' work drew much criticism and triggered a heated debate about liberalism's effect on America's moral and civic culture. What came to be known as the communitarian critique uh, accused liberalism of operating with a defective notion of the self one which ignored the social constitution of individuals and the importance of communal bonds. Liberalism, it was said, was therefore responsible for undermining notions of citizenship and community and of contributing to America's moral decline. In short, liberalism came under heavy attack for being too individualistic. It was accused of contributing to the growing sense of selfishness, rootlessness, loneliness, and alienation said to be gripping America liberal became widely used as a pejorative label, a situation that hasn't really changed. Although Locke, Kant, and Mill featured more regularly in debates about liberalism, Constant made occasional appearances. And when he did appear, it was always in the Berlinian 
libertarian guise. In Anthony Arblaster's polemical book, The Rise and Decline of Western Liberalism, Constant is used to illustrate the dark side of liberalism, its deeply flawed individualist core. In particular, Arblaster enlisted Constant in an effort to prove that, quote, an emphasis on the asocial egoism of the individual plays a permanently important part in liberalism. Invariably, a reference to Constant in these post rawlsian debates involved only a quick reference to his, distinguish, his distinction between modern and ancient liberty and to his supposed preference for modern liberty defined as privacy. This depiction of Constant as an individualist fighting for the right to privacy is, of course, once again, deeply ironic and, in fact, completely wrong, given his lifelong commitment to combating selfishness and privatization. The anti-totalitarian turn came later to France, but when it did, it also led to a renewal of interest in the political writings of Benjamin Constant. What has been described as an intellectual sea change occurred within the French academic community in the 1970s when intellectuals abandoned the reigning Marxist paradigm and came to view both communism and the revolution as totalitarian. Central to this shift in French intellectual politics was François Furet's provocative Pensée la Révolution Française, which both drew from and contributed to this total anti-totalitarian climate. Choosing to highlight the revolution's negative, even pathological aspects, Furet focused attention on revolutionary ideology. He argued that it was fundamentally flawed, most importantly in its belief in what he called the illusion of politics, that is the dangerous idea that every problem has a political solution. It was this defective ideology, a kind of hyper-politicization, that was responsible for the terror and made the French Revolution a founding moment of proto-totalitarian proto French political culture. To understand the defects of the French Revolution, Furet asked people to compare it to the American Revolution. Furet was a great admirer of America and its university system, and as you probably know, spent a good deal of time not far from here at the University of Chicago. Furet thought that America and the Anglo-American liberal tradition could help the French to understand what went wrong in the French Revolution. In a nutshell, there was, according to Furet, a good revolution and a bad revolution. The good revolution was the American one, which gave birth to a liberal political culture, while the bad revolution was the French one, which gave birth to an illiberal political culture. The good liberalism was also the, uh, the Anglo-American one, which concerned itself primarily with defending the individual against the state, while the French tradition was too inclined to statism and therefore defective. Tocqueville and Constant were the rare exceptions to the rule. True liberals in the good, individualist, Anglo-American sense. In particular, Furet appreciated Constant as one of the very few political thinkers in France who understood the pathology of the French Revolution. Oops who understood the pathology of the French Revolution and its proto-totalitarian nature. Following Furet, other French scholars have taken an interest in Constant, admiring him above all as an individualist critic of the revolution. Constant was and is appreciated as someone who, like Furet himself, understood the revolutionary's disastrous overinvestment in the political. Again, this use of Constant is more than peculiar given his own defense of the French Revolution, his investment in the political, that is, his lifelong quest to politicize the French by teaching them and encouraging them to vote, and his worries frequently expressed about privatization and depoliticization. In France, too, there has been a communitarian slash Republican backlash against this liberalism, in, and including Constant as a founder. Pierre Manon, has been lamenting that, quote, the founders of liberal modernity explicitly rejected any notion of the common good. They wished to privatize and diminish, although not eliminate, the content of human life. However, I wouldn't want you to think that this reading of Constant went un totally uncontested. In, 18, in 1984, Stephen Holmes, professor of law at NYU, used a book-length study 
of Constant to promote his own understanding of liberal democracy. Holmes called attention to Constant's critique of negative freedom, his mistrust of the ethics of self-interest, and his commitment to encouraging political participation and civic involvement. Obviously irritated by attempts to paint Constant as an anti-status thinker, Holmes argued that Constant should more accurately be, be described as an advocate of efficient government at the service of liberal and democratic values. A careful reading of Constant pr pr proved precisely that there was no fundamental opposition between these values. But Holmes's richer, subtler, and I think more historically accurate uh, treatment of Constant did not stop other Americans from continuing to caricaturize him. As is the case with political theorist Philip Pettit of Princeton University, a vocal admirer of the so-called Republican tradition. In his book, Republicanism, Pettit charts the transformation of liberty from a rich and robust Republican concept to a supposedly weak and defective liberal one. He suggests that in his famous lecture on the liberty of the ancients, Constant took part in a quiet coup d'etat against the superior tradition of thinking. In large part sympathetic to Pettit's view, Quentin Skinner also describes Constant as a critic of the Republican concept of liberty, as someone, in other words, concerned only with the individual good as opposed to the common good. Liberal liberalism is now regularly compared with republicanism to the former's a disadvantage. Gordon Wood regrets how America moved into this liberal world of business, money-making, with the open promotion of interests, while Maurizio Viroli laments the intellectual loss entailed by the triumph of liberalism, which, quote, can be considered an impoverished or incoherent republicanism. Kalivas and Katznelson have recently insisted that liberalism was actually incubated within republicanism and that it was, in a nutshell, an attempt to update republicanism so as to make it safe for commerce. In a similar vein, Andrew Janeshill has called Constance a, a liberal Republican who melded a concern for both Republican virtue and liberal commerce. Paul Ray writes that a liberal like Benjamin Constance thinking was commercial in character and that he, quote, relegated virtue and public spiritedness to a secondary role. Meanwhile, groups of libertarians today continue to see Constance as an important forerunner from whom to learn and take inspiration, as can be seen on the pages of the Freeman and the Journal of Libertarian Studies, as well as websites such as that of the Future of Freedom Foundation. Constant features in, um, in David Boaz's publication, Libertarianism, a Primer, where he is described as a 19th century libertarian, and um, Constant's lecture on the liberty of the ancients compared with that of the moderns, is reproduced in Boaz's Libertarian Reader. David Boaz is executive vice president of the Cato Institute. Uh, in the Freeman, Jim Powell, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, credits Constant with having fantastic insight that one could only wish today's politicians would take to heart. At www.libertarianism.org, <coughs> Benjamin Constant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I know how to Google. <laughs> uh, Benjamin Constant is used to explain basic libertarian oh. principles, noting that to libertarians, the basic political issue is the relationship of the liberal to the state. The site quotes Constant in support of the notion that liberty means to pursue project of one's own <coughs> choosing. Etienne Hoffman's edition of Constant's Principe de Politique, translated and published by Liberty Fund, is favorably reviewed in the Journal of Libertarian Studies and can be purchased directly through their website. The author of the review, Gary Gallus of Pepperdine University, writes that Constant's principles of politics merit space on the bookshelf of every lover of liberty. The debate over Constant recently reached the highest echelons of the American legal system. In his book, Active Liberty, Interpreting Our Democratic Constitution of 2005, Justice Stephen Breyer of the US Supreme Court takes inspiration from Constant to maintain that in a democracy, citizens must participate constantly and actively. In what seems to be a response to Justice Breyer's book, Harvard Law Professor Charles Freed, who served as Solicitor General to, uh, for Re Ronald Reagan, 
offers a contrasting reading of Constant in modern liberty and the limits of government, unapologetically asserting his own belief in the, principles, in the principle that individuals come first. Freed claims Constant as a kindred spirit. What Constant really meant to promote was not political participation. I don't know what's going on today. Was not to promote, you see it's the PPP. Meant to promote was not political participation, but the power of choice. You try to say that. Uh, Self-determination and the triumph of individuality. At a time when Americans again faced threats to liberty, albeit kinder, gentler, or less obvious ones than fascism and Marxism, Fried hopes that by propagating his Constantian view of liberty, he might update Friedrich Hayek's message in The Road to Serfdom. So to end by addressing the theme of this conference directly, was Constant a commercial Republican? From a rigorously historical perspective, the question doesn't really make sense. The term and concept commercial Republican, I don't think existed in his lifetime. He would not have understood it or described himself as one. The question we might instead pose, I have suggested, is when did he become one and why? Thank you. Do you want to sit here? Maybe? No, I can sit here. We should be. Should we? Uh, the camera. Oh, for the camera. Uh, you kind of dress for That's the occasion. Right. <laughs> well, if it's for the camera. <laughs> so, first of all, thank you for the paper, which I had the treat to read in advance, obviously. So. Um, in his semi autobiographical novel, Adolf, Constant wrote, quote, nearly always, so as to live at peace with ourselves. We disguise our own impotence and weakness as calculation and policy. It is our way of placating that half of our being, which is, in a sense, a spectator of the other. This novel, which focused on the amorous affairs of the narrator, presented a young man torn between passion and convention. He struggled with the question of whether to continue his all-consuming relationship with an older, already attached mistress, or to sacrifice his ardor for the sake of his career. The constant that we've heard about in Dr. Rosenblatt's paper today is a less saucy and perhaps less scandalous figure, but he is no less torn, with one half serving as a sort of spectator to the other. Dr. Rosenblatt does an excellent job of showing how constant in his own time, and for a great deal of time to follow, argued for a political order in which engagement superseded apathy, in which a benevolent heart overcame the selfish and material principle that he felt permeated 19th century France, and in which self-sacrifice and patriotism overcame self-interested desire. Constant's liberty suited to modern times involved the creation of a stable, genuinely representative government which worked against despotism in all shapes. But this image of Constant was torn asunder starting in the mid 20th century by scholars and writers who began to portray Constant as a classical liberal whose faith in the individual entailed a distrust of government and its potentially totalitarian interventions. To return to the quotation with which I began, this interpretation transformed the impotence and weakness of the individual, so emphasized by Constant in his own time, into policy and calculation. As Dr. Rosenblatt shows, Constant has become a sort of projection screen upon which modern American hopes and fears have played out. If nothing else, the debates over Constant can foreground our own assumptions, presuppositions, and divisions. Even the selective way that scholars have chosen which of Constant's works to cite and which to omit, like his religious writings, demonstrates how theorists from all perspectives have molded Constant into ideal types, ready to support their positions and foil those of the opposition. Constant has become a sort of weapon of sorts, whose words were sharp in his own time, but whose target has long since changed. By recognizing that Constant is not, as Constant has seemed to be, we're required to ask why then we've made him this way. One question that I would raise is why is Constant specifically so powerful for this? Why did he go into eclipse in the 19th century only to be resurrected in the mid 20th century by Hayek and Berlin? And why was he in particular the figure upon which so many ideologies were staked? What might be philosophically implied by his thought that leads liberals to claim him as they do? 
So to take the original quotation, for example, Constant seems to suggest that it can be in our own self-interest to deceive ourselves and potentially others. Is that tendency to deceive a potential source of a particular view of self-interest, which we see as being at odds with collectivism today? As Dr. Rosenblatt shows, it seems that something as, on the surface at least, apolitical as taking Constant in his own context is to some extent a political act. It involves the resurrection of a figure who defies neat labels, 20th century categories, and simplistic notions of freedom, representation, and oppression. To my mind, one key element underlying the debates that Dr. Rosenblatt has described is the fundamental question of why 20th century theorists have so fervently argued that self-interest and collectivist structures are adversarial, when, as Rosenblatt points out, for Constant, quote, there was no fundamental opposition between these values, meaning liberal and democratic values. Dr. Rosenblatt highlights some crucial political developments in the 20th century, like World War II and the Cold War, which facilitated the classical liberal interpretation of Constant. But I want to suggest one other element that seems important here. The existence of a 20th century notion of self-interest that portrays collective and self-interest as binaries. As Rosenblatt explains, Isaiah Berlin portrayed Constant as someone who endorsed negative rather than positive liberty. In this sense, freedom was styled as a capacity for free action versus a freedom from external restraint. There were two options, and the true freedom of the individual fell into the <coughs> latter category. To operate in self-interest in this instance meant maintaining the right to be protected from collective, collective forces. Likewise, in her discussion of Rawls' work and the resulting criticism, Rosenblatt points out that liberalism was seen as, quote, responsible for undermining notions of citizenship and community and of contributing to America's moral decline. In essence, self-interest, as it was portrayed here, led to egotism, hyper-individualism, and transitively moral defects. But all of these interpretations rely upon an implicit and singular understanding of self-interest and individualism. For someone like Constant, there was a long legacy of seeing certain forms of self-interest as compatible with collective interests. These would have existed as mutual supports, and indeed, in many cases, they were inseparable. Furthermore, Constant would have been familiar with the prevalent Enlightenment idea that there are multiple types of self-interest. He was steeped in the writings of Rousseau, as I know you are as well, <laughs> who argued that there are healthy, natural forms of self-interest as well as pathological ones. This is a common 18th century sentiment which can be found in the works of other philosophs like Condillac and Condorcet. Avicius argued that self-love was the natural self-preservational sentiment that each person felt for himself, but as he showed step by step, through systems of pity, something like the golden rule developed. It was through the germ of self-love that social commerce, morality, and the relation of the self to other selves derived. In his own words from De L'Esprit, I easily discovered the source of human virtues. I see that without sensibility to physical pleasure and pain, men without desires, without passions, equally indifferent to all, could not know personal interest at all. Though without personal interest, they could not assemble in society, could not make conventions between themselves, could not have general interest, and consequently no just or unjust actions. And that as such, physical sensibility and personal interest have been the authors of all justice. Personal interest in this light was the source of all social and collective goods, many of which were then administered and overseen by government and its affiliated powers. For many of these writers, there existed a distinction between self-interest narrowly defined and a concept of self-interest that recognized that, in the words of Pufendorf, by a commerce of aid and services, each person can better tend to his own interests. Commerce, in both the social and material senses, brought new advantages to fellow humans. And while it was dictated by self-interest, the self-interest was not to be redu reduced to a thin, egotistical system of desire and self-gratification. Granted, other types of self-interest did exist that could be detrimental to democratic governments, and it was these types that Constant decried as selfish. In short, what I want to suggest is that a more robust and indeed 18th century concept of self-interest might go a long way toward mitigating some of the perceived tensions between statism and individualism that have for so long formed the crux of some of these Constantian debates. I'm thoroughly convinced by Dr. Rosenblatt's claims that these tensions are the creation of a historical era, our own, 
and were not the product of Constant's own thought. Why then, it must be asked, are we so invested in the concept of a commercial republic? And why must we look to the past for validation or for models if the problems that liberalism presents are so characteristically our own? And if the lessons that we take from Constant are not those of classical liberalism, and I'm convinced they're not, then what might those lessons more fruitfully be? Well, thank you very much for that thoughtful and thought-provoking comment, and uh, I'm sure, I'm sure I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> now, um, you you call my attention, you remind me of Adolf, of course, and that's a, like uh, I took that out. I didn't talk about it in my presentation um, um, because it didn't fit, um, but uh, the time mainly I didn't have enough time for it. But um, of course, Constance. Uh, reputation, and particularly in the 19th century, was really bound up uh, very much also with Adolf and the bad reputation he got because it was read as a kind of roman à clé, you know, like that he was really talking about his relationship with Madame de Stael, an older woman, and he can't get, he can't get rid of her, he can't decide whether he should leave her or stay with her, and, and he feels trapped, and, you know, and this was uh, thought to be really, really terrible. Um, and she had loaned him money, she had helped him in his career, and it was just a, considered really, really bad. Um, I don't think it's quite as simple um, as that. I think it was probably a composite of a couple of the women. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah, so he was probably insulting three or four, and not just one. But, um, and also, you know, so her family, uh, she refused to see him on her deathbed, and that was a little bit of a tragedy. Anyway, so part of that was um, his bad reputation. I mean, he, and when you went sort of into a Victorian era, you know, he was a big gambler, um, you know, and, and so there's this, and he had a great sense of humor. So uh, apparently, this, so the story goes that um, he was standing, he was in some gambling house, and, and you know, he kept losing money, and, and Madame de Stael would bail him out. Um, she was one of the richest women women in Europe at the time, if, if not the most. Anyway, she would, uh, he would. He was standing there gambling one day, and somebody, you know, saw him and said, "So, you know, what are you up to these days?" And he said, "Oh, I'm thinking about religion." <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know, he would do this kind of. It'd be very funny. There, there are there are um, comments about him. There are recollections about. He was a great orator. And he would annoy his adversaries no end because he would stand up and he would start to ramble. He go and then he'd get into this. He'd, he'd make these jokes at the expense of his opponents, but they'd be so funny they would laugh. <laughs> and, and and so uh, anyway, so he was this kind of jokester, and he was maybe they thought of him as a little bit of a gigolo. And so then all this <laughs> uh, and this sort of serious stuff, it didn't seem to connect and. Uh, that's one of the reasons, I think, for his, uh, some of his bad reputation in the 19th century. But by the way, I didn't want to say that he went into complete eclipse in the 19th century. Um, uh, for example, I was talking about La Boulet uh, recently, and La Boulet, because of, um, uh, under Napoleon III, the, the despotism of, of Napoleon III, when he starts to liberalize his, his regime in the 1860s, he, he re-edits, he, publishes again Constant's writings. And it's interesting because, of course, Constant wrote against the first Napoleon. And so La Boulet republishes, thinking that the situation is pretty much the same. Uh, we need the same values, um, the same Constant. So, so he becomes, again, kind of a favorite of the Liberal Party. And the Liberal Party is, is spoken about again during um, this period of, of Napoleon's reign in the 60s, 19, 1860s, of course. Um, so um, his religious writings really did go into like total eclipse, as far as I know. Again, this this is reception history is kind of new, and um, there's still a lot to be. Oh, a funny story. Um, so you you know the the newspaper uh, clippings and that I was telling you. I, I found now that you can you know scan papers right digital uh, newspapers in the library, and I was so excited. You know, I went there. And I found all these references. And then in the 19th century, it's like masses of them. Banshee Michael's home, like, oh my god, this is such a treasure. It turns out there's another Banshee Michael. Oh no. And a, a, an artist. And so I had to go through, like, sift, and they were all about him. 
I would love to have those references because uh, I, I didn't well, even know the, that Nietzsche spoke about it. Uh, this is, well, one of the, I, mean, one, I think one of the publicly ever found throughout notebooks uh, indicates Wagner uh, that uh, love is the least generous sentiment. When you injure it, uh, it lashes out the lover, but the lover wants to grab more than the greed and the lack of generosity of the lover. Mm. And the other one is along these lines that it, uh, to Kantianize the duty to say the truth to make life impossible. <laughs> well, that's that's because of um, there was a um, dispute between Kant and Constant about mm -hmm. lying. You know, when Kant said the thing about that you can't lie, right. Constant happen. said that's ridiculous. Uh, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what yeah. the thing is, but if a uh, if a uh, policeman, you know. The Gestapo, obviously he's not talking about the Gestapo, but if Gestapo, now I'm doing it, Gestapo comes to, you, comes to your door and asks the so-and-so there, you can say no. Um, that's okay to lie. So that was probably... It makes that impossible. Well, you know, and to answer your other comment about you know, whether he was naive or whether he was cynical or whether he believed what, you know, it really is not. He said on the, on, the, on the floor of the chamber, I am a Protestant. Okay, now what kind of Protestant was he? I think he was kind of a Unitarian sort of person, but he was not terribly, uh, <laughs> did that sound rude? <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, I have a tremendous respect, so that, uh, that's not what I meant. But um, he, you know, and he speaks actually beautifully in another, what we were talking about, and, and also uh, you about sentiments, about um, beautiful section where he says, when you look at the sea in a sunset, um, the tremor, and that when you hear the wind blow through the trees and you get this tremor up your spine, that's religion. That's when you feel the awe. That's when you know there's something bigger than yourself. And that's a very healthy emotion. Now, a lot of people will say that's not really religion. You know, he redefines religion in some kind of way. But I think he believes in it in that way. Michael? Yeah, uh, what is uh, Chris' views uh, on, uh, on his uh, distrust toward the government? How does this atmosphere play out today? And what are also the religious implications? How would his, the religious? You know, his his, his criticism? Oh. Saying that he's anti-government, uh -huh. liberalist uh, view. How, how would uh, the distrust that the American society, society has for government today, how does this, how would, the, what are the implications of, of, of his, his philosophy? Oh. Uh, and also, with his, also in relation to his religious, his 
Well, I think um, now you're really asking me. You know, I'm a historian. I'm a strict historian, but let's play this game. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm winging it here, but you know, I think that he would, um, he would uh, uh, again talk about how politics is an ennobling uh, activity, how uh, we need to be critical thinkers, uh, how uh, Protestantism again. Um, develops the values uh, of, that are needed in a liberal polity. So we need religion, not only for self-sacrifice, for that emotion of thinking about something larger than us that will come back, the materialism and the selfishness that is a product of, the, of, of civilization and of commerce. Um, but also, he and Madame de Stael both had this view of Protestantism as being about uh, critical inquiry and private judgment. So the the duty, the obligation, as he said it, of Protestants, I mean, this is a certain type of Protestant con uh, discussion, um, to read the Bible and think uh, about the Bible um, is something that makes them uh, better citizens. I think, can you, did you say something like, somebody said this uh, today. Uh, and um, so he would uh, be for separation of church and state, Entirely, he was absolutely an advocate of that. He would be very sad that people are not more politically involved, um, and he would try to tell people he'd be going around the country saying, "This, this is what you're supposed to be doing: go vote, and and don't vote for Trump." <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Mike. Mike. Well, so You're the one who's fielding, or you can choose yourself. No, I'm going to choose myself. Uh, so I'd like to push back a little bit okay. to get to what I think is maybe the most important question. So Constant never uses the word individualist. It doesn't show up in France until Tocqueville in 1840, in the third tome of Democracy in America, and then it takes all. And Tocqueville wants to distinguish individualism, which is a sentiment and the result of a mistaken judgment about how one should live, he distinguishes that from egoism, which is a kind of passion, which draws one in. Individualism draws one into a smaller society than the larger society. So, so he doesn't talk, that's not the language he uses. And he doesn't use the language of negative and positive liberty. And I think there's an interesting intellectual history as to how he gets from what he, how thinking about Constant goes from what he actually does say to what he's taken to say. And I think you're right about that. But here's the title of the book, right? Of, the, of, of this great essay, right? Of the liberty of the ancients compared to that of the moderns. So this is an essay on ancients and moderns and different views of liberty. So what I'd like to hear is what you think he takes the difference to be between ancient liberty on one hand and modern liberty on the other hand, or what the similarities are, because he doesn't say contrasted, he said compared. Right. But these are the two things of liberty. And okay. one last thing is part of the question. I mean, one of the most interesting things about the essay, and of, and of all who talk about the ancients and the moderns, Christendom is completely left out. <laughs> right? I mean, this is about Athens, and this is about Sparta, and this is about Rome, the Rome of ancient Rome, and then it's about the modern world, mm -hmm. but there's not an account of Christendom and what liberty might be like that. So that's an interesting thing, okay. right? But there's the ancient liberty has some view of what that is, modern liberty has some view of that, and it's important, he thinks, to compare these two, and there's something that comes out of that. That must be really the important nugget that people are trying to get at, right? Right, okay. So, individualism was not a word, uh, was not first used by Tocqueville. It was used in 1825 by uh, Du Noyer, I think, but uh, in industrialist, uh, the industrialist, right? And Constant, very, you know, I think pointedly in his, one of his last essays that's published at the end of his 
this collection of essays sort of summarizing his ideas, says that he's for individuality. So he, on purpose, doesn't use that word because I think he thinks of it as an egoistic, materialistic kind of you know, selfishness, whereas individuality has within it this moral impetus of self-improvement and everything, which is not egocentric. I'm suspicious of the Buddha, yeah, but that's okay. That's it's a, yeah. that's it's, it's in I, this wonderful I, book called Liberal Values. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, my guess is he's using it in a very different sense from Tokyo, but the, I think the important point is he thinks there's a difference between ancient and modern liberty, and Berlin takes that to be negative and positive, and right. you don't. So what is Constant trying to say? Well, uh, let me, let me think, think this through for a second. I'm, I think that there's been a overemphasis on something, that they've dropped the bit about how you need to build a state before you can contest the state. Mm -hmm. And he is interested also in building a state and a stable political order. And he believes very strongly in political participation. Now that a lot of that essay is about the individual and uh, this uh, different kind of liberty that moderns want. I mean, there's been, you know, there's many ways of, of reading it. The way I read it, it was delivered at this uh, Atene, right, at this society, and, and in front of all these industrialist types, all these uh, younger uh, thinkers, uh, liberals, if you will, who are actually been inspired by Constant's earlier work, and in particular his uh, work on commerce, and who were beginning to uh, think that, well, hey, maybe this business about constitutions is besides the point. What we really need is a strong economy, and we'll build the economy first, and then you get a middle class, and then you know all the other wonderful things will come. Let's stop trying to create the perfect political system. It's just not possible under these circumstances. Some, something like that. I'm, I'm slightly simplifying the argument. And so I think, I think that my reading of that essay is that he stands up before these people and he basically gives them their argument back to him and he, you know, he, to them. And at the very end, if you see what he and and Constant had a habit of doing this. His speeches on would end like he'd go into a crescendo. You know what I'm saying? Like he would like it was like spiraling. They said he did these body movements too, and by the end he'd be like <laughs> shouting. He like shouting the the punchline would come at the end. So I think you this, should take this on Broadway, by the way. I can sing. I'm <laughs> all <laughs> I am totally. Uh, yeah. And so I think so. The the last few lines of that essay, as you know, you can read them. Oh, it's in French, so that's okay. We're all. Sure. Yeah, it says uh, you know. Sirs, general. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, where is At it? The end. Very end. Very end. Is it? Okay. Speech given at the Athenee Royal. Um, so where? Therefore, sirs. I'm not a woman in the audience. Therefore, sirs. <laughs> or well, if they were there, they didn't get mentioned. Okay, maybe they were there. Therefore, sirs, far from renouncing either of the two sorts of freedom which I have described to you. It is necessary, as I have shown, to learn to combine the two together. Institutions, says the famous author of the history of the republics in the Middle Ages, must accomplish the destiny of the human race. They can best achieve their aim if they elevate the largest possible of numbers of citizens to the highest moral position. Now, where is it where he says, um, you haven't looked at Most the, Yeah, where he says, you know, no, if you know, we're just going to become like little worker bees. You have to, you know, politics is ennobling, and stop uh, thinking that, uh, yeah, like that, just about work and products and commerce. Politics is ennobling, and you know, don't forget it. I think he's telling these people that. But yes, he also believes the other thing. I'm not trying to say that he doesn't, you know, that he's not for individual rights or he's not for. Um, guarantees against the government. Yes, he is, and he had lived through the terror. He had seen the terror. He'd seen Napoleon, um, and you know, so he knew the dangers of you know universal male suffrage without protections. You know, a plebiscitary demo democracy, a sham democracy, and so this is also the context. 
I think, for his advocacy of individual rights and privacy. You know, I mean, they'd literally come to your house and you know knock on the door and drag you away right. if you said the wrong thing. So, Darren, yeah, I, I love this book, I love this book. and uh, I, I'm under it. Liberalism was reinvented in a different way. And the same is for two reasons. One, because of the Louisville University. Mm -hmm. The word liberal is reappropriated mm -hmm. uh, before Hayek by Franklin Roosevelt. Oh, yeah. The Commonwealth Press. Yes. Um, and he, he means it in a different way. Oh, yeah. Um, and the other is um, the extent to which the way we understand this reemergence of liberalism is to some extent separate from the context in which it occurred. I don't know if it's getting this right. Um, which is to say, for example, you mentioned Hayek and his critique of wealth. But Hayek actually publishes the Union of Values of 44, but writes it in early 30s, right? He, he, the first essay. 39. I, I, I think so. And even before that, he circulated at LSD some of the uh, essays, I think even earlier. Um, and there he's referring not so much to the Danger of communism as to really bad attempts to plan economies uh, in Austria. The things mm -hmm. that brought Dimitri Schumpeter down. Mm -hmm. And my sense is, I think you're right, he is read today as a critique of the welfare state. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's what he meant to do. I think he meant to, pre to, to uh, criticize socialist planning as being ultimately unsuccessful because, as an ex socialist, he knew they'd never have the stones. Mm -hmm. to actually force people to do it, and therefore they would be followed by someone who would. Mm. Well, thank so, you for that. I'm, you know, yeah, I'm not I'm, an expert on Hayek, so I'll, I'll look yeah, into that. Look I may be doing a Hayek, but I don't want people to do that. That's important. But I think that actually exemplifies it's natural for us to do that. Yeah. We're thinking of our own debates. It's very debates, difficult but Hayek not to. Hayek actually turned out to like the welfare state. What he didn't like was um, basic stuff. In other words, I don't think he would have minded transfer payments, but he can't stand his jam job. <laughs> seriously, right. like that would freak him out. It's right. the idea that you can aggregate that information up and make judgments over uh -huh. thousands and millions of transactions, I you see. know, by removing dials and exits and all these things work. And um, uh, one of the things that triggered this question was Ford's comments about Christendom, because it seems to me in each period, they're reinventing fast and we still need to be doing it too, hmm. where we're sensitive to it, but can we avoid it? In other words, yeah. there wasn't the Middle Ages till we called it one. Mm -hmm. There wasn't the Dark Ages till the Enlightenment was created. Someone invented the Renaissance. It didn't really happen until James Newton. Mm -hmm. you know? or, or did it? I mean, that's, that's the question. Did, yeah. did Burkhardt invent the, the uh, Renaissance, or did he discover it? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, um, totally, <clears throat> totally agree. But I, I see. Uh, my larger project, which I was describing to you, which is this history of liberalism, where I try to follow the word and the meaning of the word as, as it becomes, some, you know, and when, when was the first liberal party and what did that mean and when was the liberalism used and what did that mean and how did it get changed in different contexts in different countries. Um, I see it as like an exercise in, in kind of clarification, historical clarification, and I'm not, certainly not saying it's the only way um, to do a history of liberalism, I agree, you know, I, so I'm still, and I totally understand, I have to fight with myself because we, we have these categories, and I don't know if we can live without them, really. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to talk to students or among ourselves, or what are we saying, if we just refute, you know, will not use a single ism or ist, or, you know, if we just talk like that. So, so I completely agree with you, but I'm, I'm doing my best here. <laughs> with this book, and I hope that I managed to say something interesting. And now you said FDR and Hayek. The, one of the really interesting things is that, um, you know, now if you pick up a book on liberalism, a lot of them start by this kind of disclaimer. It's such a vague concept. It's just in, in it's chaos. Um, we don't know really know what we're talking about. But I'm going to say it's this, and then. Then they say something, and then they tell this history, basically cherry-picking from the past 
the I, or reading previous thinkers in a way to prove or to in a genealogy that arrives at this thing they call uh, they call liberalism. Um, in fact, there is disagreements among, and they, they all seem to agree. Now, this is what I want to say. Even though they say that it's so so difficult to uh, define and so on, everybody pretty much agrees that it was about the individual and self-interest. And the detractors and the defenders say the same thing. Now, up until the mid-20th century, there is a big discussion about this. As you say, you know, Herbert Hoover was arguing with FDR about, no, you're using the word. I'm, I've got quotations that were wonderful. It's like, I'm just fed up. They've stolen the word. <laughs> He's, he, it's, it's, I'm just, OK, then. You want to take it. You're a bunch of you know, communists. Anyway, you know, pretty, <laughs> I'm not sure that was Hoover. That one might be mixing my wonderful quotes. Um, I have to check. It's in the epilogue. I'm not there yet. Um, <laughs> so, um, so there are actually, and he talks about generosity, freedom and generosity. Uh, and and uh, that's what I, I, one of the sort of themes throughout my book is that from the very beginning to be liberal was not only to be freedom loving but to be generous mm -hmm. and uh, giving. So the kind of the opposite of self-interest and they kept stressing this. Now their enemies and their opponents kept saying you're a bunch of selfish bastards. You, you're just interested in yourselves You want to because they wanted to take other people's privileges and uh, you're you know, maybe these ideas of commerce, I don't know, they kept saying you're anarchical, self-interested individualists. And it's just weird that at some point in the, around the Cold War time, they say, okay, you know, yeah, we're self-interest, we're, self we're for the individual, and they kind of drop. I mean, I, you know, again, there's always exceptions, you know, but generally, I see that whole discourse, that whole side of it drops out. But it's there uh, through B FDR. Mm -hmm. things that, that I want to sort of discuss. Um, I have a, a comment and a question. And the comment is um, about Hayek. I mean, that was an interesting part of your talk. And, and I was thinking that Hayek, um, maybe this is something to be written by somebody about Hayek's appropriation of the liberals. But he kind of does the same thing with Hume. That he, I mean, Hayek has this sort of like romantic, he falls in love with all these older thinkers. He does it with um, John Stuart Mill. Um, right. And, um, and in the case of Hume, I mean, he sort of pins on him this whole idea of spontaneous order, which, you know, like somehow yeah. Hume was the discoverer of spontaneous order, which I think, you know, is not something that I think it does not really use before, maybe before he writes it, before mm -hmm. Hayek. Um, so that, that's... Polanyi. Uh, <coughs> that? Michael Polanyi. Michael Polanyi, okay, fair enough. Um, but it's certainly not in Hume. I mean, the, the name is not in Hume. The, the, what the concept is, is in Hume. But so, so here's my question, which is, um, it seems to me that, that you're bringing up a lot of themes that are really important for this whole conversation of what do we mean by this sort of historical moment of college commercial republicanism, mm -hmm. however else you describe it. And it, the thing that struck me is that it sounds that your Constantian position sounds like it's quite close to Tocqueville's worries about mm -hmm. um, the modern world is going to produce a bunch of shrunken, you know, Gilbert-like people who don't have the generosity to get out and participate in. And in Tocqueville's case, right, I mean, religion obviously also plays a big role for him. That's the great thing about America, is we still have religion that gets people out of their shell. Um, and, and there are lots of people in the 19th century who are trying to come up with like a, a substitute for traditional religion. Mm -hmm. John Stuart Mill's Religion and Humanity, mm -hmm. and things like that. But in, in, so I, in Tocqueville's case, when he's talking about the religion of the Americans, it always has this kind of character of like, well, like you, what your parents said, when you finally turned 12, you know, kids, it's really important for us to go to church. Yeah. I've been to church for a decade. Right? It'd be really good for you to go to church. And there's this kind of element of like, it would be good to believe these things. Yeah. Right? But it's not so clear that it, it's, I mean, it's sort of like it's socially useful for the Americans yeah. to believe in religion, which is very different from saying we actually do believe these yeah. things. No, that's why, no, yeah, I, you, you're absolutely right. I think that these are uh, political thinkers who are approaching religion from the political point of view. So it's, it's usefulness as a, I mean, tr troubled souls in a way. Uh, I mean, other people um, have written about this with Tocqueville, his loss of faith in his uh, teens and then, but his respect for religion. And similarly, Constant uh, said that he was sort of an atheist or something. He I can't remember the exact 
the exact uh, quotation, but he, oh, he, 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 you know, he went to Edinburgh for a university. He, he by the way, uh, for this conference, he quotes Adam Smith all over the place. And he was obviously immersed in the Scottish Enlightenment. And while there, he, he was part of a the Freemason club and as well as some other club, gentlemen's club, where they discussed topics like religion. And he was, it, it you gave don't want to see lyrics. And he, yeah. <laughs> and he he would have liked that. Um, he um, uh, gave a, a lecture or a speech about the superiority of polytheism or something there, you know. So, but he was thinking of a religion his whole life, and you know how much of a believer he was. You know, it's not I don't it's not my my thing that I can answer answer that. I do want to say that there are great similarities between Tocqueville and Constant, but also some important differences. And I, and I, I wrote a paper about this sometime um, uh, and published it somewhere. Uh, but I think that Tocqueville um, it has a Catholic background. Of course, and he speaks glowingly about Catholicism, right, in, Fran in America, growing and it's doing just fine and all that. But when you really look at the way he treats religion, for him it's a form of kind of, um, this is too strong a word, but like mind control. You know, he wants that part of your life settled, the anxiousness of your soul and these questions. In order to be a good citizen, you can't have that going on. So dogma and all that is fine. You need to go somewhere and somebody tells you, calm down, you know, God loves you kind of thing. Whereas for Constant, uh, I think he sees religion as more of a spur, like uh, something that's going to perfect you, that you can, and thinking and critic, being critical is a good thing. And he was much less pessimistic uh, about the future and about democracy. I mean, he died uh, in 1830, which is, you know, so Tocqueville saw things after, and his, he was less pessimistic about commerce um, than Tocqueville was. Hope I answered your question. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. It's, it's not particularly useful to understand the constant to look at him through the lens of the liberal communitarian divide. I mean, it's, that may be an interesting other story, but that's not really a story about what constant is trying to do or trying to pursue. Um, you used two words um, that I think are very um, suggestive uh, in thinking about this moment as well. One of them is system, and the other is institution. And the degree to which, um, a, from Madison to um, someone like Willem Humboldt um, to Coleridge and the Constitution of Church and State, the, the possibility of locating individual political will and agency within some kind of social and cultural matrix, which needs to be regulated in some fashion. So what are governments about? They're trying to establish uh, a way of ordering power, a kind of system for within which both community and individual can flourish. And those are all very different approaches, but I wonder is there something uh, in particular that Constant would see as, um, as a ground for uh, an institutional theory of governance? Um, is it cultural for him? Is it, is it social? Is, it, uh, is there a kind of, so you talk, we'll talk about cul culture being an incredibly important ground. Um, Coleridge looks at a kind of balance of a notion of a nation that's both religious and cultural and has to do with historical memory. Well, he's very interested in all those things. And he, uh, you know, he, he doesn't just talk about constitutions. You know, he writes about culture. I mean, in these, in these discussions where he's worried about apathy and so on, he has, and he's a beautiful writer, as some of you may know, so he talks about um, how the, you know, that the dissolution of society because of French Revolution, it has turned to dust. People with, without intermediary institutions, the um, individuals are not, their bonds are broken and they're just these atoms and the wind will come and it will blow them away. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, I'm just trying to think while I'm answering. Um, and so, but to, and to how to re-knit the bonds is something that both he and Madame de Stahl are talking about. So. So it's through institutions like government, it's through uh, the press, uh, books. They both talk very much about the um, obligation of elites to cultivate cult the, the public. Um, 
am I answering your question? Well, yes, and I, I think in, the, the sort of spirit of the question is whether we're going to be in century, there are a number of experiments um, to try and see, see government or the state um, as a series of arrangements which are about processes that are active and dynamic and living. It would be these organic theories of the state. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, right at the, the, the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, wondered whether, in some sense, this integrative move, which I see them as Madison is doing, and I, I say Humboldt and forward is my guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, Poisson is referenced in the context of, of this bicultural in a number of places. And oh, really? Him enormously, and, and Madison as well, and he meets Humboldt in Rome in 1804 or something like that. So there's, there's all this stuff's in the air, and I'm right. curious, and they're all made Which I haven't things. really thought about it um, enough. I'm sure you know there's something there. There's always <laughs> it's it's very interesting. There's a lot of um, things to con you know to look at because of this tendency just to look at one 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 essay and read him a certain way. Uh, a lot has been missed. So there's work still still to be done. Um, certainly, um, certainly. I knew I had something I wanted to say. Offering the third way analysis, I guess that would be important. Third way analysis. I'm gonna have to think about it. David? Yeah, so um, just thinking, uh, Helen, about the, um, the neoliberal misreading mm -hmm. uh, of, of Confine. I mean, it's pretty clear where they go wrong, isn't it? They're basically, they only read the speech mm -hmm. of 1819. Pretty much. Uh, and they misread it because they think that Confine is extolling the transition to modernity that mm -hmm. he sees as being made. Fact, as I read that speech, it's much more neutral. In fact, mm -hmm. and yeah. he's just saying, this is what has happened. Mm -hmm. right. uh, and given that that, then your reading of Constant uh, makes perfect sense because in this altered condition of modernity, what you need is to inoculate modernity with some of the qualities of engagement mm -hmm. uh, and communal <coughs> action that are in danger of, of being lost. Mm -hmm. So that's a way of sort of bringing all these two, all these things together, I think, mm -hmm. understanding you know, how your interpretation of Constant fits in with so I was also thinking about uh, what you were saying in, in connection with Adolf and, and wondering whether in the ambivalence at the end of that novel, we can see that, that Constant has in some ways kind of put in, in both camps a bit. So on the one hand, Adolf at the end of the novel uh, is an, an illustration of how a life lived according to individualism in your emotional life just leads to desolation. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, he's a kind of glamorous, ironic, down, bigger, uh, and that you know, living your life selfishly in that way, bad, sure, yeah, ends up happening. <laughs> but but he's not ridiculous. He's not ridiculous. He's a kind of uh, charismatic figure at, at the end of the novel. Um, anyway, I mean, that's sort of um, that well, thank you for that because it reminds me uh, again of of Adolf, and I have a reading of Adolf which is, um, in a nutshell, this. You know, there is a central, you talked about the spectator, and there is a central part of the novel where um, he describes this um, happening to him. You know, I became as if divided in two, and I had this, and I, to me, um, it's a complete uh, lifting of a passage in Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments. Uh, and I can't tell you the exact passage now, but it's about when Adam Smith talks about sort of the, the creation of a, of a conscience through uh, the eyes of the, the spec mirror, the mirror the and, the, and so on and so forth. And I find it interesting for many reasons because, of course, the theory of moral sentiments was way more popular and more read than the wealth of nations and at the time. And it was huge in Paris and in France, and Madame de Stahl just lapped it up. And of course, the whole idea of the sense of, of, of compassion and sympathy and her novels, these, these thick novels are, you know, with these glorious women that are so sympathetic and so compassionate and they're just going to heal the world with their goodness <laughs> and overflowing, yeah, genius of a very uh, loving kind, right? Um, you know, is, is her take a little bit and, and development of, of uh, Smith. So, and they're big novels like this. So, Adolf, 
a cold star responds with this thin little <laughs> cutting thing, you know, it doesn't work. He, I think he says, you know, this just put, keeps you in the spiral of a sound of selfish. It doesn't make you better. Have looking at yourself, and it's like two two different uh, of you. You're just it's just self, you get stymied in this position that is not moral. You don't move forward. You don't leave the woman because you can't. Um, and you, but you don't love her, so you're just miserable. And it doesn't and, and you know this compassion or the sympathy that's created by you know seeing yourself through somebody else's eyes leads to nothing. Uh, so I just think that's part of their kind of their, their, you know, so maybe he was, you know, it was about her, uh, that novel, but not quite the way people say, not on the personal level, but at a certain point they're sparring with each other intellectually, which is far more interesting, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we have one more session. Uh, we have a 45-minute break. Uh, we can meet again at 4 o'clock in the Sullivan Room, which is on the second floor, exactly where we are now, but five floors down. At, at um, 4 o'clock. Four. Four so I looked at the passage in the book. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't Jumiere. It was a review. Oh,